So allow me to introduce. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know the Ellen and John. Anyway. <laughs> Even though the sweater. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jacket? Uh, me? Okay. <laughs> Hi. I hope it works. Um, I, I wonder what part of acting do you uh, consider to be extra difficult and how do you do to work with it and overcome? Okay. Well, uh, if you're, you know, if you're talking about, what's your name? Agnes. Or Agnes. Agnes. <laughs> so I think that. Uh, the important thing about acting is finding out what your character wants. But then technical difficulties, when I did, oh yeah, I did Broodmother and Death Prophet and Dota 2 as well. And uh, Broodmother, just technically, is very hard on the voice. So sometimes uh, you have to do things with your voice that that are kind of uh, damaging to the to the voice, so you have to be very careful. There's that kind of thing. But if you're talking about just an acting question, what is difficult if you are playing a character that is very different than your experience? You know, playing a computer, 
Yeah. What a, you know, a computer is very difficult from my life, from my experience. So I had to think about what GLaDOS wanted, what GLaDOS was interested in. Because really, GLaDOS does have feelings, even though she denies it. <laughs> now, he, he has better answers. Oh, do I? Okay, well, um, uh, I think, are, you, are you an actor? I mean, are you studying? I'm studying acting, yes. Uh, um, I think that, that the thing that I, I mean, it helps if you're, you're borderline psychotic delusional. You know, so that, I mean, the, the great thing about delusional people is they can be in the same supermarket that everyone else is in and not be there at all. You know? And I think that that's really the exercise, the, the, the thing that absorbs me in acting is, and I, and I tell this particularly to young actors when they're auditioning and they, and they get nervous. Uh, because you know, say if you go to audition for the National Theater, something really important to you, and you really want it to go well, and you hope to get a job there, and you're afraid that if you don't get a job there, and the audition doesn't go well, your career is over, and you go out and kill yourself or whatever. You, know, you really work up some nerves about that. And what I find is very, very helpful is to become the character. And remember that the character is not auditioning. The character doesn't know that there are other people in the room. The character doesn't know there's an audience out there. You know, if I were some you know space monster in a game and I was performing in front of you guys, you guys would just be food. You know, I wouldn't care about your opinion, I would just care about whether or not you were rotten. You know. And, and so to really get inside the character and become the character and only care about what the character cares about, uh, get you so far. Um, I think that for me, I kind of naturally I'm a writer anyway, and so I just fill in the backstory, backstory, backstory. Backstory, and uh, to me, this—the more backstory you have, the more you flesh out your character in your own mind. The more you can say, uh, if you're on stage in, in front of a live audience and something goes wrong, the more you can continue to be your character, even though maybe you know you're not saying the lines anymore because a set piece has fallen over or something like that. And uh, there was a there was a wonderful time uh, I did a production of. Peter Pan, you know the, the English show Peter Pan, the very play, and everyone got sick. I mean, like we did this for two years, and we figured out at the end of two years we'd done one third of the performances with full cast and crew. Two thirds, somebody was out, and one time and understudies were right, and understudies were on. And one time the little boy who plays Michael, the younger son, he was sick, and so they brought his understudy on, and fine and good, he was doing pretty good, except they forgot they'd never tried it on the flying harness. You know, in Peter Pan, it's like flies, right? So they have to have this fancy harness. He went off stage to take his bath, where they ostensibly put his harness on. He never came back. He was there out there, you know, fiddling with straps and buckles and all this kind of stuff. And uh, my friend Stevie Cowles was playing Mrs. Uh, Darling, and I was Mr. Darling. And in the beginning of the play, she puts the kids to bed and all kinds of and I come in, I'm all upset because I can't tie my bow tie, and she ties it and saves the day. And her first line, when I, when I first came to the door, all upset, she says, what's the matter? And she was wandering around trying to figure out what to do. She sent the kids off to find me, so now she's on the stage by herself. Michael's off trying to get his harness on. She sent Wendy and John off to find me. That was her brilliant improv idea. So now she's like, you know, making the bed, straightening things on shelves. I finally hear over the headphones of the assistant stage manager that I'm over her headphones, I finally hear, just get somebody on stage with her. So she shoves me out there, and I'm all ready to go. I'm all ready to, you know, to improv about anything for hours and hours and hours. And so I come on stage and I say, what's the matter, dear? Because she sent the kids off to me. I'm totally playing the improv. And she turns to me and says, what's the matter, dear? Which is her first line. And after that, the audience was very confused. <laughs> and I said, oh! We're doing that now. Okay, yes, my bow tie is all messed up. Oh, yeah. But, but, but to really be in the frame of mind of the character, if something like that goes wrong, you're still the character. You're still right. awesome. Um, uh, and, you know, some people say, oh, you know, how do you cry? How do you laugh? Uh, I think that, you know, these are techniques that you can develop. I mean, sense memory, all these kind of things uh, help you. Uh, you know, I mean, I can be cold whenever I need to be cold. So. You know, you, that's all sense memory. And you can practice 
tax that stuff and learn that stuff. Um, but really, most of it is commitment, yeah, commit committing to the character. And, and I think the other hard part, and you may agree with this or not, is analyzing the scene and from the, the words that you have, because sometimes you don't have those words to define your character. It's like, who is this person? Where do they come from? What are they doing here? What are they like? And uh, uh, if, you, if you're doing a very old play or a very new play, it's a whole channel. If you're doing Shakespeare or uh, somebody like that, Molière, you just like, okay, what did people, you know, what was Shakespeare after in this joke? What was he after in this scene? What's going on here? And so analyzing the language can be uh, a challenge. Um, but, but I would say that, that most of those problems can be solved by just, you know, figuring out who the character is and what the character wants and why the character can't have it. That's the, the two things in acting, what do you want and why can't you have it? Because any story is a problem. Once the problem is solved, the story is over. That's a really long answer to a really short question. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You're it's very great. <laughs>you know, to elaborate on that, I have a personal question. Um, I've always found it strange, like, when you're doing Death Prophet, for example, or one of those evil characters from, say, Dota, I mean, how do you, uh, what do you imagine he's like as a person? Because, like, I can see when he's fighting the Alliance, he's up doing that stuff, but a Wednesday, 3 o'clock for Death Prophet, or, like, the age-old Mitch, how, how do you... <laughs> Death Prophet, follow your food. I was pissed off the whole time <laughs> because I'd been brought back to life and I wanted to be dead. <laughs> I mean, what will piss you off more than that, right? Hate them out. So we'll, maybe we'll go over there. Uh, you guys in the red shirts. Um, oh, you first. Try not to die before Mike gets there. Uh, been going a bit on the, the early question. Uh, both GLaDOS and uh, the man, uh, is, uh, I, I was called an announcer. What's their official name? Is, is it the man? What? Just the announcer, actually. Uh, yeah, the, the, and the announcer from uh, Team Frozen 2. Yeah. Both were very, um, uh, let's say, I was, uh, both were very uh, cynical, very mean. Very mean, very. Uh, uh, well, yeah, um, I don't think that Gladys is cynical. I think no. the announcer is cynical. Yeah, not cynical. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of. Uh, sorry, suddenly my I forgot my English all of a sudden. Where are we? <laughs> no, uh, but uh, yeah. uh, uh, no, no, no. But I mean, it's like they they have this. Uh, um, Disdain, this, uh, this, it's, it's like they're completely disgusted by yes. the player character. They actually, like, they, they see the player character like this um, well, really I, I stupid little insect. Your name, sir. Uh, Joel. Joel. So, Joel, I think that the difference between, for example, GLaDOS and the announcer, GLaDOS really wants things, she wants to test. She's all about testing, and she wants that. And I think that she is passive aggressive, but she feels that she needs to be sort of nice to the player. That's her motivation for lying to the player, to tell the player about the cake, to tell the player about, oh, I saw a deer today. Would you, would you like to see that deer? I could take you upstairs, or I could go upstairs and see the deer. So, but the administrator is a bad teacher. <laughs> the kind of teacher who yells at you when you are not doing what you should be doing. I teach a lot. I rarely yell at my students. I tell my students when they sing a song, I say, well, Good work. You stood up, you sang, you know your music. I didn't say, that is ridiculous. <laughs> You're terrible. <laughs> Over time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but the announcer is actually trying
trying to get a good result from her army, but I don't think she goes about it the right way. I disagree with her methods. Although, when I was doing the announcer, when I was recording the announcer, I totally owned that. <laughs> uh, in fact, that's also true. Uh, I know uh, you can respond before I had the chance to ask my question, but... Uh, yeah. What? Uh, yeah. But uh, is it okay if you ask my question? Yeah. Because the, that was that's honestly was a much better answer than I <laughs> than, my, than my question. But well, uh, go ahead and okay. ask your question. Uh, how much of what you just said, which was an excellent explanation, how much of that was um, the director or was in the like uh, was um, directed uh, uh, or in the script, and how much uh, of these? Uh, Wonderful uh, characters, did you invent yourself? Uh, did yes, you I understand. Make her... I understand, Johan. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. Well, of course, I have the words to start with. But when I go into the studio uh, for the administrator, uh, Mark Laidlaw, well, I call her the administrator, the announcer. Mark Laidlaw was there, who was the writer. But also, Bill Van Buren was there who was sort of the producer-director. So I would do like three reads of over time. Over time. Over time. And Mark Laidlaw, I would see his lips moving and he'd be talking to Bill Van Buren. And then Bill Van Buren would, you know, touch the button and say, uh, uh, Ellen, could it be could it be more angry? <laughs> so, yes, I would be using my own emotions, but the writer and director would also uh, give me input if they felt that I was doing what they wanted. So, so it's a combination. I, I would have to say 50-50. Thank you. Yeah. So my question uh, to both of you is, which role has been the most fun to record? Um, there are a couple of them, and, and, and Sniper is, is very close to my heart, because he's the only person I've ever gotten to play who kills someone and then insults them. <laughs> that, 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 that's just such a warm human thing. <laughs> very fun for me. Uh, the other character that I played was a guy named Warden Harms in in uh, uh, is, it, is it Infamous or Fear? No, I think it was Infamous. Uh, where they're going into this weird government chemical facility, they made this weird drug or gas or something like that. And, and he starts out as a very brusque kind of Gene Hackman professional mercenary guy. You know, and he's just going in there, he's doing his job, he's killing people, and he's fighting all this kind of stuff. And then he gets, uh, he inhales some of this gas, and he starts hallucinating, which is it's, it's, it's kind of a nerve gas. And he starts hallucinating, and he hallucinates this beautiful woman that he falls in love with. And he gets, he's totally unmanned. Just, Totally, it's like a, a teenage boy, you know, with, with a crush on a girl, and it's like she's a hallucination. She can never have her, and so that was very interesting to do. Um, another fun thing was uh, I played a South African rapist, <laughs> um, <laughs> and Halo ODST, who ultimately gets ripped limb from limb by an angry mob, and I did about 90 seconds worth of screaming. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that was fun to construct because now here you know getting back here you know, it's like this is the problem of acting okay acting is storytelling you know you're doing something that takes place in time it starts at this second and goes forward in time and ends at, a, at another second and so all I have on the script is that I scream and they tell okay you're being ripped apart uh, you actually die you actually ripped limb from limb by an angry mob in a train. And so I get to tell a story just to the screen. And so first it's like, what?
story. It wasn't just screaming, right? You, you see, oh, they're coming into the train car. Oh, they're pulling on my clothes. Oh, now they're pulling, you know, now they finally ripped me one from them. So, so that's the kind of fun. That's, uh, so those were some of <laughs> And that's the official like on ringtone. For <laughs> <laughs> well, and to answer your question, I have to say, of course, GLaDOS, because I've, I've done more GLaDOS, because I, of course I did GLaDOS for Portal, and then I did GLaDOS for Portal 2, but then I did GLaDOS for Poker Night, <laughs> and then I did GLaDOS for, you know, the uh, announcer pack for Dota 2, and, and so, you know, I keep doing that character, and um, it's, it's really, you know, at one point I had to go back, and, and for Gypsy Danger, Gypsy Danger is GLaDOS, because that's what Guillermo del Toro wanted for his film Pacific Rim. He wanted GLaDOS, so I did GLaDOS again. <laughs> so, uh, doing a character uh, uh, over a period of time, and more than once, you know, usually if I'm doing a play, I just played a character for four months, uh, a character named Miss Lark, and you know, it was fun. But if I would then go back and do Miss Lark again, and do Miss Lark again, and do Miss Lark again, it really becomes part of you. So uh, I was going back at one point to do GLaDOS, and, and I was nervous, and John said, why are you nervous? You are GLaDOS, <laughs> and and he's right. So it's like I don't get I don't get nervous to do her anymore because she's me. I'm her. And when I told her that she was GLaDOS, I meant it. What I meant was I am married to a passive aggressive homicidal computer. <laughs> As a bit of a follow up to that. With GLaDOS, you've essentially like set the the standard for artificial intelligence in media like forever. I think whenever someone goes to do a representation of an artificial intelligence, that's where they're gonna look from the start. Is that something you uh, anticipated when you did no. the game, or was that no. just really surprising? No, and and the first time I went into the studio. Uh, I was asking the writer, the principal writer of Portal, Eric Wolpaw, I was asking him about the character because I didn't really understand the character and he said, oh, you know, like how in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah. So, so really, my GLaDOS was the female version of what I thought Hal did. Yeah. Hello, Dave. <laughs> was developed by a group of students at a school outside of Seattle called DigiPen for their senior project. And Gabe Newell went to adjudicate the senior projects. Gabe Newell is the director, the head guy of Valve. He saw their senior project. He hired them on the spot. Their senior project was called Narbacular Drop. So he brought them all in as a team to Valve and he said, I'm going to give you a minuscule budget, make a game. Actually what they told us is they said, you have no budget, make a game. Yeah, you have no budget, make a game. So they used a computer generated voice to voice the part of GLaDOS. But they found out that that computer generated voice was copyrighted and it would cost them more to use the computer generated voice than to hire an actor. <laughs> so I got hired to do GLaDOS because I was cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, when they had a real person, this started altering the writing. Yes, and it did affect the writing because they realized that more emotion could be brought in. Because, of course, the first GLaDOS voice, before she loses the morality core, is Welcome to Aperture uh, Science. You know, and of course it's uh, it's uh, auto-tuned. Auto right. But after she lost the morality core, they realized that oh, we can actually have Glados, you know, get angry and 
and be disappointed and be sad and and all and be, yes, all sorts of human emotion that they couldn't have done if they had actually had to stick with the computer generated voice. Did that answer anything, Max? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I figure we need to do the portal gun, because if you have a portal gun, you're gonna have a good question. Yes. <laughs> Hello, what's your name? I'm Tobias. Uh, Say it again. Tobias. Oh, Tobias! <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, if Chell had a voice, what would it sound like? Would... Well, you know, I met, I met the actress who was the physical model for Chell. And her name is Alicia. And uh, we actually appeared in a video together produced by NASA. <laughs> and uh, it's called Fusion versus Fission. I saw, I and it's a video. wonderful video put out by NASA. And Alicia plays a scientist in the video. And of course, who do I play? Gladys. The computer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Alicia. I mean, she's, she is a very interesting woman. She has a beautiful voice. You know, she's gorgeous. She's also a director. And uh, I feel, you know, if, if Chell had to speak, it certainly wouldn't be my voice. But uh, she might be, I'm thinking, oh. Well, see, I always heard Chell like this. So, I think I'm going to the mall. <laughs> no. Okay. Chell would have a mid-Atlantic accent. You know. Yes. Yes. I always figure of a southern drawl or something like that. Oh, no. No, no, no. no, no, no. no, no. You don't get a vote. You are not an adolescent male. <laughs> yeah, I mean, only people who fantasize about Shell get a book. You're either an adolescent male or you're an adolescent lesbian. Those are the only people who get a book. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Maybe you hand it behind your green iPad like that? <laughs> Sitting here, I'm picking people who have like easily identifiable objects. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I see glass right there. Very impressive. All right. Wait, okay. Uh, yes. So <laughs> this isn't really a question, but rather a kind of request. My little brother is a huge fan of. Well, he's a gamer, but uh, he's a huge fan of Portal in particular. And his birthday is coming up, so I was wondering if the two of you could like sing give him birthday. no, but give him birthday greeting. Sure. <laughs> what is his name? Uh, Jonathan. Jonathan. Do, you, do you want us to go to his house? <laughs> 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 Peter is fine. So, so, so you're recording on. I'm recording this. All right. You ready to go? Okay. I think we should sing.